preparing for live stream. Okay. So we'll be going live in a minute. Okay. I think Dr. Anthony Fong is in the room already. Okay, so um, we're live on Facebook. Um, one moment. Just have to go back to Zoom. Oops, there you go. All right. So, good evening, everyone. How Hi. how is everyone? Hello, Doctor Fong. <laughs> so happy again to have you in our um, learning forum. Uh, we cannot see you yet. Uh, I I don't know. Your video is not on yet. Maybe. Um, yeah. Um, Reese, maybe you can share the virtual background in the chat um so maggie and migs can share our jeng berber and and everyone who wants to open their camera and use the um virtual background that we're using right now okay so let's wait um in like 702 in my time, um, three more minutes while everyone is coming in. So uh, let's just um, welcome everyone. Wow, we have um, we have participants all the way from Indonesia. Hello, good evening. Hi, you can chat or you can chat or uh, unmute yourselves and say hi and good evening to everyone. Yeah. Good evening. Hi, who was that? Hi, Jeng. Uh, Miss Maggie, hello. Yeah, so. Um, hello. Yay. Hi, Miss Maggie. Good evening. Yes, good evening. Uh, we're happy to um, see everyone. This is our um, monthly learning session. Um, we invite experts um, to talk about um, treatment, management, and um, anything that concerns scoliosis and patient um, management um, for us to learn um, and also empowered with the, uh, you know, the power of information. All right, so we're very um, privileged tonight to have uh, Dr. Anthony Fong with us uh, to talk about fine core. Okay, so um, anyone, um, anyone who is, um, anyone who is, um, you know, happy to share their, uh, anyone in the room who has like their spine core stories, um, you can share it later after. Dr. Fong's um, presentation. Okay, so yeah, so we have one more minute. Okay, so Dr. Fong, are you ready? We have we have one more minute. Hi, Dr. Fong. Are you good? Um, I think you're on mute, Dr. Fong. All right, uh, we have, we're exactly 7.05 in my time. Okay, um, let's start with a prayer. Um, may I call in Migs to lead the prayer, please? Thank you. Hello, everyone. 
um, let's bow our heads for the prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you today asking for your guidance, wisdom, and support as we begin this learning forum. We thank you, Lord, for the Sclerosis Philippines team, our speaker, Dr. Anthony Fong, and for our participants that you have gathered today. Help us to engage in meaningful discussion, allow us to grow closer as a group, and nurture the bonds of community. And continue to remind us that all that we do here today, all that we accomplish is for the greater, greater glory of you and for the service of humanity. We ask these things through Christ our Lord. Amen. In front of Amen. All right. Good evening. Welcome. Welcome. Welcome to our uh, learning forum uh, on spine core conservative scoliosis management. And I see Dr. Fong uh, is already Hello, how ready. How are you? <clears throat> can can you? Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm running a bit late. Yep. Yeah, it's all right. Um, can you um, can you talk, Dr. Fong, so we can check your uh, audio? Uh, yes. Can you hear me clearly? Um, maybe you can put your mic uh, closer. It's like, closer? Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, to um, introduce our speaker, may I call in Rizzi? Okay. Yeah, uh, Rizzi, please uh, introduce our speaker. Good evening, everyone. Um, let us welcome our speaker for this learning forum on spine core conservative um, scoliosis management, Dr. Anthony Fong. Um, he graduated with, with a Bachelor of Medical Science, major in Advanced Neuroscience from University of Sydney. He has a Master of Chiropractic from Macquarie University. He is also he was he is also a radiographer and radiographic supervisor in uh, New South Wales, Australia. He he is the chairman and founder of Care Asia, Singapore, Care Corporations, Corporation Philippines, Care Indonesia, PT Indo Sihat Utama, and Care Limited Hong Kong. He is an accredited Care scoliosis consultant, and an appointed spine core trainer, examiner, distributor for Asian territories. He is a faculty speaker, trainer, examiner on spinal-related disorders. He has been in cl clinical practice since 1996 in Sydney, Australia, Singapore, Indonesia, Malaysia, and the Philippines. Prior to 2007, he is a National Registration Board Examiner. He is also a Senior Lecturer and Coordinator of Anatomy and Physiology for over 10 <clears throat> years and presented seminars on differential diagnosis for scolio, uh, musculoskeletal disorders. Again, let us all welcome Dr. Anthony Fong. Hello, everybody. How are you? Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting us here. Thank you to Amanda and Ms. Risi for the introduction. <clears throat> and um, it's an absolute privilege um, having this talk with all of you. Uh, I always look forward to having all these um, chit chats. So let's keep it as informal as possible. Um, today's talk is mostly about spine core, the conservative treatment. And the main purpose of the talk is that over the last few weeks or so, we always have a lot of people calling us and asking questions about giving seminars. Now, if any of you have been to seminars, especially about scoliosis, you probably hear the same sort of things over and over again about scoliosis is where your curve is tilted to the left, tilted to the right. And it gets to a point where I think you've probably heard that more than you know, 100 times already. So we'll try and keep something new. Um, today, it's mostly about a lot of people always have questions about scoliosis. What do we do about it? How do we treat it? What is the latest research? And for those of you who know anything about spine core, um, you've probably been looking at the internet. And oh, by the way, uh, just, just a quick note. If any of you have any questions about references, research papers, uh, we have plenty. So um, in, in a previous seminar that I, that I gave, uh, you can check on YouTube. If you type in debunking scoliosis myth, you will see a lot of the references being um, presented there. 
Uh, if you have any questions, you can always message me and I'm more than happy to forward the papers to you. So today's talk is mostly about braces. And there's so many different types of braces out there. And everyone's having questions about, look, if I have scoliosis, what do I do? Well, what are the best options out there? And some of you have probably seen all these different types of braces in the market. Or some of you have probably used one or two of these. And so a lot of you are probably wondering, so if I have scoliosis, which one should I use or which one's the most effective? And what makes your brace different? Okay, so today's talk is specifically mostly about spine core, the research, and the studies behind it. And, and a lot of the papers that, that supports spine core is, is actually done independently. So, so at least we have, it's actually quite, in that sense, unbiased in terms of the, the studies. So if you've been looking at Scoliosis Philippines, um, the founder of Amanda, you have all these wonderful, beautiful ladies over here. And of course, men do have scoliosis as well, except I think some of them are too shy to, to, to model here. Um, you've probably been looking at either Scoliosis Philippines or if you're in Indonesia, you've been looking at the uh, Indonesian scoliosis community, if you're in Malaysia, and you probably see interesting pictures like this. And I know a lot of you actually message me and, and ask me, look, I've been looking at the Instagram or Facebook and I see x-rays like this. And you can see before, after, where you can have a curve like 29 degrees go all the way down to nine degrees. Or in the case like this, where you may have someone who has a double curve, 45 degrees uh, on the left side. So you can see on the left side here, 45 degrees in the top, 51 at the bottom. After bracing goes down to 31, 37. Without the, bra uh, with the brace, it goes down to 27, 39. And something like this where you have a triple curve and you can see that all three curves start to drop and oh mind you this actually is actually quite interesting the lady who wore this she's 17 years old she wore the brace and then she was very naughty she did not wear the brace for three weeks and yet despite the fact that she was not wearing the brace for three weeks the spine was able to maintain the stability so if any of you have been wearing braces like hard braces or other types of braces you may notice that when you wear the brace, it seems to give you good correction. But when you remove the brace, your spine slips back into its old position. So what does spine core, what is so special about spine core is that if you wear the brace, and there's been a lot of studies behind this, where after two years of not wearing it, or even after five years, quite a large majority of those patients were able to maintain the curve without slipping back to their old original position. So then we look at other, other pictures like this, where you see the top is 44, bottom is 43, after the bracing goes down to 33, 30, and then you also have this 53 on top, 47 at the bottom, 39, 35, and so forth. So you have 27 down to five degrees. As a matter of fact, today I had a, uh, a young lady who came in and she was interested in looking at the brace and we were discussing this. So you know, we'll be talking about that. what is that spine core and what is the product that we are dealing with? So, so far, so 47 down to 31. So you're probably wondering what brace is this? And the brace that we're dealing with is called spine core. And in case you're wondering what is spine core, it is basically, if you're looking at these components here, you've got the top, the shorts and the elastic bands. Okay, so it may look very simple and wondering how does this simple elastic band actually work? And there's a lot of research behind this and we'll go into it and, and how does it work compared to a rigid brace. So spine core was, was founded by orthopedic surgeons. So a lot of people are actually not aware that spine core has a very strong medical background. So initially it started in Canada by the, in, in Montreal, in St. Justine Hospital. And it was started by Professor Charles Rivard and Dr. Christine Collard, both of which are pediatric orthopedic surgeons. And the whole purpose behind this was that they were commissioned by the Canadian government and they were given a $12 million grant to try and find out what causes scoliosis, how does it develop, what is the process, the mechanism, the pathway. 
Now, if you've been on the internet, you've been looking at um, spine core and you've been looking at the pictures, one of the most amazing things that you will notice is that you can wear this brace and remain active. So it's very different from rigid braces where you're quite restricted. You're unable to play sports or move. Where spine core, you can. So in this picture here, you have a ballerina. Oh, these two are two completely different people. They're not the same. Uh, this is a ballerina. She actually does wear the brace. And on the other side, it shows you how flexible spine core is that you can actually wear it, do splits, gymnastics. As a matter of fact, we have a lot of people who are who, who are hip hop dancers or Muay Thai, as you can see in this next picture. This lovely lady here, she does rock climbing, yoga, um, MMA, and she wears the brace. And it's extremely flexible. So it does support you and, and provide the stability for your spine whilst allowing you to be mobile. Now, the other thing that we look at is that, oops, now we also, for, for those of you who know, this is uh, Angela, a uh, beautiful lady, uh, Philippines Next Top Model from 2017. Uh, probably some of you are not aware of this, but she does wear the spine core as well. And uh, it was an absolute privilege to, to brace her. Uh, she's a lovely, lovely lady. And, okay, so some of you are probably wondering, what is spine core designed for? And it is, if you're a child, it is mostly designed specifically for scoliosis. And we're dealing with idiopathic scoliosis, meaning it is not a scoliosis due to um, a neurological disorder or metabolic disorder. And the main objective in children is to try and correct it as much as possible. In some cases, especially for some children going through a rapid growth spurt, you might not be able to correct it, but you are able to slow it down or or, or try, and, try to, to stabilize it or provide support. Now, on the other hand, if you're an adult, there's a lot of comments that you normally hear from a lot of the doctors or specialists that there's no point bracing adults because it's not going to reduce the curve. And the, the objective of spine core when you're bracing adults is you're not trying to reduce the curve because studies have actually shown that you can even straighten up a curve in an adult if you can, and they will still experience pain. So for adults, the main objective of bracing is actually not to reduce the curve, but to provide stability, pain management, provide support, structural support, and, and to, to also provide uh, postural improvement. And, and it's also cosmesis. So the bracing for adults, it, it, there's a lot of misunderstanding behind it. So when we when we give seminars that we train, because we, we train a lot of specialists from orthopedic surgeons to rehabilitation specialists, to pediatricians, to physiotherapists, chiropractors, everybody. And a lot of times the orthopedic surgeons will say, why are you bracing adults? You know, you're not going to change the spine. And the question, and the answer is, we're not trying to change the spine. That was never the objective of spine core in the first place. So the main objective in adults is to provide pain management and stability there. And so the other thing is, if, if you have scoliosis, how do you know you have scoliosis? So some of you as mom and dads um, or, or as, people, uh, as patients with scoliosis, this is probably the first time you've joined us and you either probably just discovered you had scoliosis and it's actually quite daunting. I, I do understand that it's actually quite a scary feeling that once you've been told that you have scoliosis and now you're wondering, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? Now, for some of you, mom and dads, you're probably wondering, how do I know if my child has scoliosis? And one of the most easiest way to do this is to have the child bend forward. So this is what we call the Adams test. Now, the Adams test is not foolproof because you can actually have someone bend forward and the spine looks perfectly level. Okay, so that would be what we call functional scoliosis. Now, if someone has a true structural scoliosis, when they bend forward, you will see one of the ribs or maybe the lower back more prominent. And so if someone is bending forward and then they don't seem to have any rotation or any prominences, it doesn't mean they don't have scoliosis because you can actually have what we call false negative. Now, if, if you look at this picture here, you have lovely, uh, we, we thank the lovely lady, I won't mention her name, but uh, no, thank you for letting us use your picture. Um, you can see if someone has scoliosis and they're bending forward, there's a few things you look for. 
One is, do you see any prominence over the ribs and over the lower back area? And secondly, does the spine seem to tilt more to one side when they bend forward? Because if you don't have scoliosis and you bend forward, your spine should be, should be bending virtually perpendicular to your, to your pelvis. But if your body is leading to one side, that's something you need to take that into account. And does the upper body curve to one side? Have a look at the waistline. Do they look symmetrical? Now, on the other hand, if your child is standing, have a look at them from the front and the back. So the easiest way is to have them standing in front of a mirror so that you can actually have a look at their posture and look at the level of the eyes. Are they on the same level? And then you look at the shoulders. Are they are they of the same slope? Is one side angulated more? Have a look at the collarbone. Does the collarbone seem to be more of a V shape or does it look a little bit more tilted like an L shape or does it seem to be more flatter? Then the other thing you look at once again is to look at the waistline. The waistline is usually quite a, quite a good giveaway and look at the torso. And then you look at the angulation of both sides. Then you look at the pelvis. Does it seem to be tilted? And then look at how the arms are dangling from both sides. Then the other thing you look at is have a look at the shoulders relative to the pelvis. So if I was to draw a vertical line up the pelvis, that shoulder should be almost sitting on top of it. And whereas if you look at the other side, the shoulder seems to be a little bit further in to the pelvic area. Now from the back, have a look at the level of the ears. Are they on the same plane? Have a look at the contour of the neck. And once again, have a look at the slope of the shoulders. Then you have a look at the shoulder blades. Does one of them seem to stick out more, more prominent? Is, is, it more, is it protruding more than the other? Have a look at the waistlines. And once again, the pelvis. So these are some of the things that you look at. And once again, look at the shoulder relative to the pelvis and see whether or not it's sitting on top of each other or is it leaning slightly or has it translated more to the side. And so when you look at someone's posture, you always hear this saying, your posture is the window to your spine. And so if you're looking at someone with bad posture, you can usually assume that they have scoliosis. But the problem is this, that is not true. Okay, so you will always hear this comment, your posture is the window to your spine. And I just would like to say that that is actually quite a, a, a good comment. It isn't because we've seen a lot of cases where a child can present with a beautiful posture. And when you take an x-ray, it's absolutely horrendous. And then you may have someone who comes in with, with really horrible looking posture, take an x-ray and it's, the spine is fantastic. So you cannot rely purely on just posture to, to, to tell whether a person has scoliosis or not. So you do need to take, go one level forward and take an x-ray. So see your practitioner get an x-ray done and look for things such as any curvature in the spine. Now, the old model of scoliosis usually tells you that if you have scoliosis, you either have a curve in the upper body, it's usually on the right side. Left side is not as common, although it does, it, it, you do see it. And see whether or not you have a curve in the lower back area. It's usually on the left side, more common. Oops, something's happened to my picture. Um, you may even have a double curve or in some cases, triple curve. We've seen four curves, five curves. You may have the classic C curve. And if you're looking at someone from the side view, hunching more than 50 degrees. So this is the, the traditional model of scoliosis where you have about seven different classifications. Now later on, we'll go further. So a lot of the, the treatment, the, the procedure, the therapies, the, the bracing procedures are based on this model the, the seven classifications. Now, there's a lot of theories behind scoliosis. So for some of you, I, I know the first question a lot of people say when they see this is, ah, it must be the Squid Games, okay, the tug of war in the Squid Game episode. So when you're looking at scoliosis, a lot of people actually think that this has to do with muscles. So a lot of therapists, a lot of specialists that we talk to, we ask them, what do you think causes scoliosis? And they will say, muscle imbalance. And so they will prescribe lots and lots of exercises, lots of rehab exercises. And the idea behind it is that you probably have an imbalance between the left and the right side of the body, therefore causing you to move more to one side or the other. 
Now, another theory is that it probably has to do with your nerves. So there may be something wrong neurologically. And because there's something wrong with your, with your nerves, then it's probably the one that's causing uh, weaknesses in how your body behaves or imbalance or your position sense, and therefore that causes scoliosis. Another theory is that you have what we call the nerve impingement syndrome, where you have a nerve that comes out between two bones and then it's been irritated or compressed or squashed. And surprisingly, you may even have MRI CT scan studies where you can see a nerve being completely compressed. And the individual can have absolutely zero symptoms. And then you may have other people who have a very mild misalignment of the spine. And there may, there may be an absolute excruciating pain. Okay, so one of the theories behind scoliosis is perhaps this may be the one causing the spine to tilt. Now, the other thing is there could be possibility that there may be some sort of disorder with your ears because it causes balance, visual problems, your joint problems. And these are some of the uh, so-called theories behind what causes scoliosis. Now, when we talk about scoliosis, there's also other things such as instability of the spine. So if I'm looking at the spine from the side view, you can see that the bone on the very top, it is sitting relatively further backwards compared to the bone below. Now this condition is called spondylolisthesis. It's a mouthful. And spondylolisthesis has two types, either retro or anterior, which means that bone has either shifted forward or backwards relative to the bone below. But there's also, so you can see this whole, this bone here shifted backwards. Now you may even have bones like this, where if you look at the very bottom right here, where the bone is actually shifted to the side. So you can see this bone is shifted to the side more relatively than the bone above. And this is called lateral isthesis, where it, the whole bone is shifted to the side. So that can cause scoliosis too. So what happened was this, in 1992, the Canadian government, as we mentioned, gave $12 million to the orthopedic surgeons, uh, Professor uh, Charles Rivard and uh, Dr. Christine Collard. And the team comprised of 65 researchers, everything, everyone from uh, bio statisticians, um, biomechanic uh, specialists and, and scientists and, and, and doctors. And they were, their main objective was to find out what causes scoliosis? How did it originate? And what is the mechanism, the pathway to how scoliosis uh, progresses? And most importantly, what do you do about it and how to treat it? And so that was actually how Spancore was born. And for Montreal, it went all the way to UK in Sheffield and Spancore is now in, in UK. So every time you hear about Spancore, it's what we call Spancore UK. Okay. Now, throughout the research in 1992, they, they did many different studies and this was actually the model that they came up with. And it explains quite a fair bit about how scoliosis originates. What is the mechanism, the pathway? So what they first realized was that scoliosis is a genetic position, a uh, condition. Now, before you go and blame your mom and dad for it, Okay, it, it, it's not as simple as that. Because we do see a lot of cases where mom and dad have absolutely no problem, but the children have scoliosis. Or in some cases, you may have mom and dad who have very bad scoliosis, but all the children are perfectly normal. And then in some cases, you may have mom and dad or family members who have it, and the child may have it. So there's a certain uh, percentage of uh, inheritance there. Now, so from the genetic fault, what it does is that it affects how your bones grow. So this is looking at your spine from the front and the back. So when your body is going through its growth phase, your, your genes will express itself. And it will, it, it's kind of like a program to the body to say, okay, this is how I want you to grow. So this is your spine. And the way it's supposed to grow is that the bone is supposed to grow upwards, downwards, lengthwise, uniformly, symmetrically, like this. And so your spine grows pretty much like a tree, like a bamboo, it grows upwards. Now what they found is, is, is it's like a concept, of, uh, when I explain this, it's like the cooking a souffle. When you're baking a nice cake, a souffle, both sides 
are supposed to grow evenly and they're supposed to rise in the oven evenly and the cake will rise perfectly vertical. Now imagine the case of a souffle like this where one side is rising slower than the other side, then the whole cake starts to tilt. So pretty much in a nutshell, if you want to simplify scoliosis uh, in terms of its growth, that's actually what we're looking at. So if you're looking at someone's spine like this, let's concentrate on this area where it's tilted. So if we magnify that, what we see is that in this area, one side is growing relative to the other, the bottom part is nice and symmetrical. The part that is affected is growing slower relative to the other side. And the other side continues. So as you start to grow, you have asymmetrical growth patterns. So which means that one side is growing faster than the other. And then over time, you will end up compressing the bone that is affected. And unfortunately, studies actually show that if the compression continues, it actually stops the growth of the side that is compressed. So over time, this will lead to the bone changing its shape. So your bones are supposed to have this very nice rectangular type of a look. So you can see this bone here. If we concentrate on this bone, you can see what happens here. One side compared to the other is asymmetrical in height. And then because of the compression, it looks more like a wedge. And once the spine starts to wedge on an x-ray, you can actually see that it forms more like a trapezoid type of a pattern. And that is actually one of the ways we you determine where the primary site is. Now, when your spine starts to have that asymmetrical growth and it changes the shape of the bone, your whole spine starts to destabilize. And once your spine starts to destabilize, it affects your posture. So the more you start to lean to the right, your body will try to compensate by leaning other parts of the body, either the lower part or the upper part, to try and maintain your center of gravity. And so you can see in this lovely lady here, her waistline is altered, the shoulder height is changed. And then it doesn't just change the posture, it, it changes the whole structure. So you can actually see from the skeleton here, the pelvis, the orientation co completely changes. For example, if I'm looking at the ribs, if I'm looking at the spine from the top, it looks beautifully, it's supposed to be symmetrical like this bone over here. Now, if I look at the one on the, on the left side where it shows the ribs, you can see that the shape of the ribs are completely different. Now, in a normal spine, the ribs will look pretty much like a C shape facing each other. But in cases of scoliosis, you can actually see because of the rotation, it also changes the shape of the ribs. So which is one of the reasons why in, in, in a lot of people with scoliosis, one side seems to be more prominent or in the front of the body, they notice that the front of the, uh, of the abdominal area seems to be more, uh, which seems to be protruding more than the other side. Now this hair looks like an octopus, but it's actually your nerves. So, and the pink things at the bottom that looks like cushion, that's actually your muscles. So once your body starts to destabilize and you start to have postural issues, it affects how the nerves, the muscles, and your skeleton communicate with each other. So over time, what happens is that your nerves and muscles will behave um, aberrantly. So in this case here, as you start to lean more to one side, your muscles may either end up contracting more or it starts to fatigue. And unfortunately, when that happens, it causes uh, balance issues and coordination. And once your muscles start to, to, uh, to falter, then the other issue that you have, it affects your skeleton. Now, we do know that once you start to have abnormal movement because of your bad posture, the way your body's behaving, it affects how your joints communicate with each other. Now, every time you move, your joint sends signal all the way back to the spine, goes up the brain, come back down, and it tells the body how to move. And it, it, it basically works like an orchestra. So as your right leg moves forward, your left leg moves backwards, muscles uh, coordinate, one side of the body contracts, the other side relaxes. But when you have scoliosis, it affects that whole uh, tune. So unfortunately, your body will start moving incorrectly, and that also affects how the body responds again. So over time, what happens is that you can see this bone, one side is being compressed relative to the other, 
And then when I look at the center part over here, you can actually see this more compression. If you look at this section over here where I've circled it, this particular bone here, you can see over time, it starts to wedge. And in the lower section over here, particularly this bone, you can see wedging in this bone here as well. So when we talk about scoliosis, it's not a simple thing about misalignment. So you will hear a lot of people say that scoliosis happens because your muscles are pulling more to one side than the other, and therefore you start tilting. Then other people say that, well, that's because your bone is misaligned, therefore it's causing the muscles to respond um, asymmetrically. So, and then other people say that, that, well, the scoliosis is causing the wedging of the spine. And the answer is actually, the studies actually show, no, it doesn't. It's actually the wedging of the spine that causes the scoliosis, not the scoliosis causing the wedging. But what happens over time is that as your spine starts to develop more and more, it will put asymmetrical pressure onto your bone. And over time, that will change the shape of the bone. So what started off as a wedging of the bone creates the scoliosis, which then causes further wedging of the bone. So you go through this vicious cycle where it keeps growing worse. You get asymmetrical loading of the bone, uneven pressure, and then the bone starts to wedge further and further and the curve increases. So when we look at scoliosis, the studies that we show from 1992 was that if you are dealing with scoliosis, you cannot treat it as a pure muscular problem. So if you're having just pure exercises or exercise therapy to address the scoliosis, unfortunately, you're missing other components. It's like me trying to lose weight, which probably will never happen. <laughs> okay, so if, if I focus mostly on just changing my diet and not exercising, well, yes, I may lose weight, but I need to exercise as well. And perhaps I need to change my lifestyle. So it's not just one factor. So it's scoliosis, you can't just treat only the bone, or you can't just have pure rehabilitation for your nerves, or having exercises all day long and hoping they will change the scoliosis. So with scoliosis, it is, the studies actually show it is a pathology of all three things. It's a pathology of your bone, of your nerves, and your muscles. So in order to treat this, you have to treat all three at the same time. Now, this is actually where a lot of braces are not able to achieve this. For example, if I'm going to wear a hard, rigid brace, it will straighten the spine, but your muscles and your nerves will become weaker. Stimulation of the nerves alter. If I wear some other soft braces, it may provide good, strong structural support, but the muscles become lazy over time. So you need to create something that addresses all three of these components at the same time. So this was actually the dilemma that the orthopedic surgeons had to face when they were given this task back in Canada. So, the first thing they did was to find out if you have scoliosis, how many different types of scoliosis curves do you have? Now, previously we mentioned that there were seven different types of scoliosis, and that was actually the traditional model for more than 50 to 75 years. And a lot of the treatment, the bracing, the therapy was based on that seven model. And when, we, when the studies uh, was conducted on, on, on scoliosis and trying to discover how many classifications were there? Thousands and, and literally tens and thousands of x-rays were, were studied and statisticians were able to compile the data to demonstrate that if you are an adult, there's actually 12 different types of curves. And if you're a child, there's 27 different classifications of scoliosis, which means in total you have 39 different types of scoliosis curves, not seven. So this is one of the reasons why when you start treating scoliosis and you're only using the seven model, you're limiting yourself by being extremely unspecific. And if you do not address the scoliosis specifically and you target it appropriately, you may be targeting the wrong area. So if someone has a double curve, you may be giving them a traditional double curve exercise where you are over, over emphasizing a compensation, but not the primary site. So 
when we when scoliosis when when spine core was developed and it realized that there was 39 different classifications they were then able to to determine that if a person have a specific type of curve then there's a a what we call corrective movement and the corrective movement was able to reduce that curve by creating the movement use rather than the traditional model which is if you have a curve and you're leaning to the left you bend them to the right if you're leaning forward arch them backwards and if they rotating rotate to the other side that is known as the three-point pressure method which is actually used by hard bracing so traditionally they will use the hard brace philosophy and say that okay so if i'm tilting to the left side then to brace this person i bend them to the right and then put a put a plaster around them and then i will create a mole based on that and unfortunately that was actually that has been demonstrated to be ineffective but surprisingly, that method is still used to this very day, even though it's been shown to be outdated. Now, once you have the classification, you are able to use the specific corrective movement for that type of curve. And the main objective of the corrective movement is to correct not only the postural issue, but the muscular imbalance and the weight distribution loading of that bone. So you're able to target all three of that component at the same time. But how do you achieve this? And so the main objective, and the studies actually show, if I was tilted to the left, which is compressing the left side of my body, and I use a hard brace, and then I arch them as much as I can to the right side, all I'm doing is opening up the joint. And that is actually what they call static offloading. So if you're taking pressure off a bone without movement and just maintaining and just bending it open, it does not change the curve. And the studies actually show that in order to change that curve, you need to have this alternating opening closing of the joint at least 10,000 times a day. So if you go for a nice spinal manipulation, you get your spine adjusted, that will open up the spine, that will reduce the pain, the restriction. But then after a few hours or maybe one or two days, the spine is bending back into it again. It's like having braces for your teeth that you only put the elastic bands and the retainer in your teeth for one hour, then you take it off. And then you do that three times a week. Your teeth will not change in terms of its positioning. You need to wear that brace in your mouth at least 20 to 24 hours a day over an 18 to, to 24 month period. So you can actually see the changes in, in, your, in, your, in your, um, your alignment of your teeth. So very much like the spine, you can't just do exercises once or twice a week or three times a week and expect that to change your spine either. Now, so once you are able, so the spine core approach was that they realized that once you are able to determine what classification you have, they're able to, to, to prescribe the corrective movement. And once they have the corrective movement, there is a very specific bracing technique for each and every single curve. And, it, and so when we go around um, Asia and we train doctors how to do this, it takes two years minimum to train doctors with a minimum number of patients so that they are able to learn all the different types of classification approaches. And we are, we are quite blessed that in Philippines, the, the doctors there are fantastic. Okay, so you've got doctors that we've trained in St. Luke's, in Philippine Orthopedic Center. Um, you've got doctors in Nova Ecija, in Rojas, Cebu. So literally, there's a lot of spine cord doctors all over the all over Philippines in most places, even in Mindanao. Um, and well, in Indonesia, they're literally almost everywhere. Um, so you can find them a lot in Jakarta, in, in, in Solo, um, and then in Malaysia, they're everywhere, okay? So uh, we've been training a lot of doctors uh, on a one-to-one -one basis. So one thing about bracing is that if you, if you have any questions, you can contact us at any time, and we can refer you to the closest spine core practitioner that is near you, okay? So you don't have to worry that, oh my gosh, I live so far away. Where's the closest uh, practitioner? There's, there's one, someone near you, okay? Uh, you can always contact Amanda, okay? Amanda knows where everybody is, okay? Now, 
So one of the things is that when you look at spinal cord, it is not just another brace. So people are looking at this brace thinking that, oh, look, it's just another one of those braces again. And the answer is no, it's not. A spine cord is actually very unique in the sense that it does not use the three-point pressure. And there was a study done on this where they took, a, they had patients who were quite large, obese. And they wanted to see if that if they were going to use a three-point pressure method and then put them in a plaster and push and shove at them, will it change the curve? And the answer is no, it didn't. Because the problem with those rigid braces is that it was unable to gain access to pushing the muscles or the bone hard enough to, to affect a change. So when they used spine core on this very same patients, they were able to show that the movement itself was the one that creates the improvement. So it's not pushing and shoving and pressure that changes the spine. It's actually the movement itself. And so, number one, spine cord does not use three-point pressure. It uses global education. And this is something that, which is quite interesting. Once your body has learned the movement, it is able to maintain and, uh, that, that change. So you have uh, hundreds of case studies. So if, if once again, if you're looking for the research paper, by all means, please message me, where they took over 900 patients and this study was done over 16 years. And then they did studies where they were, the patients would wear the brace for two years. And then for the next two years and five years, they did not wear braces. And there was a follow-up two years later, five years later, and they were able to show that they were able to maintain the change in the spine. And they were able to, to maintain the stability without uh, shifting back to the opposition. And spine cord treats the three components, the muscle, the nerves, and the bones at the same time. Whereas other braces would only target the muscle or the nerve, or muscle nerve, or muscle and bone, but not all three. So when we're dealing with uh, scoliosis, we have to follow the international guidelines. So when we treating scoliosis, it comes under two different guidelines. Okay, so this this SOSOD and SRS. So basically, if you're going to be treated for scoliosis, you're either going to be treated surgically or non-surgically. Okay, so that's pretty much a nutshell. So if you have scoliosis and your curve is more than 40 degrees, or it's classified surgical, less than 40 degrees, non-surgical. And it really depends on the country. So in, in other countries, for example, if you're going to UK, Europe, or Australia, sometimes they will wait until 50 degrees before they intervene. And other countries will probably wait until 55 or 60. Um, other countries, by the time you hit 40, it poses a bit of a concern. So once again, it depends on the guideline of the country. Now, if let's say your curve is more than 40 degrees and you are experiencing signs of distress like breathing problems or, oh, I've got someone here called Ryan and they're sticking up all these pictures all over my, my screen. So I don't know who this Ryan is. Yep. I'm somehow hacking into my system. Okay, so if you're more than, more than 40 degrees, you're showing signs of distress or your curve is actually growing quite aggressively, then unfortunately, surgery is the only option and it's probably the best option um, for, for these patients. Now, for other patients who are more than 40 degrees and they're not showing any signs of distress, sometimes the surgeon may opt for a more conservative approach. And given that it's actually more of a conservative approach, they probably will recommend trying other things first. And sometimes they will recommend bracing. Now, the question is what type of brace do you use? And this was actually interesting because in 2019, they found that if Patients wore the spine cord brace before they did surgery. That should recover faster after the surgery. And the main reason for that was that they were able to maintain muscle tone, muscle strength, posture while they were wearing the spine cord brace. Whereas these, the hard braces, what it would do is that it will hold you up, but your muscles unfortunately become very lazy. So it takes a much longer period to, to recover from that. So, Sometimes the doctors will recommend, look, if it's not bracing, do rehabilitation. So that would actually be the other option that they will recommend. Now, if you are classified as non-surgical, the number one method is that you're usually advised to just observe and monitor. So you go to your doctor, they will assess your spine, take x-ray, 
And in some cases, there's no treatment involved. And, and unfortunately, the studies actually show that observe and monitor is not going to change that spine. And the number one recommendation now is you need to have early intervention. So don't wait for that spine to get worse before you decide to do something about it. Okay, so the moment you start to suspect there's a bit of asymmetry in the spine, go and get it treated, okay, or, or go and have it assessed. Find out what's wrong with it. Now, the other thing is, besides observe and monitor, you're told to do rehabilitation exercises. And in terms of exercises, once again, the exercises were based on the seven model. And so you've got general exercises and you've got specific exercises. So general exercises are the sort of exercises that you've been advised like, oh, you've got scoliosis, go swimming. Okay, so you'll always hear this comment, go swimming, okay? And, and I can absolutely tell you, you can swim as much as you want, it's not gonna change your spine. Okay, it will make you super fit, okay? It'll, it's good for your health. But unfortunately, it is not specific enough for your spine. And things like yoga, Pilates, etc. it's absolutely fantastic for general health. But once again, it is not specific enough for the type of scoliosis. So other than, than general exercises, you have what we call PSSE, which means physiotherapeutic scoliosis specific exercises. Now, this actually comes under two different categories. One is physiotherapy exercises, which is based on that seven model. So this will come under things like Schroff exercises, or you may have other type of exercises like uh, McKenzie, or you have um, uh, the, the, the C's exercise methods and et cetera. So there's many different exercises. But once again, that is all circulated around the seven different model. Now, when spine call was, was um, creating the classifications, they realized that, look, there's 39 different types of curves. So there must be a very specific way to target each and every single one. It's pretty much like if you have an infection, you don't just prescribe Panadol, I mean, a penicillin to everybody. Okay, because is it a bacterial problem? Is it a viral problem? Okay, so is it a, a parasitic problem? And so in this case here, once you know exactly what it is, so let's say you find out that it's a bacterial problem, then you need to find out what type of bacteria it is. Then you can prescribe the medication more specifically. And that is exactly the same thing with scoliosis. When they discovered there were 39 different types of curves, they were then able to, to create specific exercises. And this was known as corrective movement principle exercises, which is actually very interesting because the spine core brace was based on the corrective movement principle. So by using the same principle of the brace, they were able to apply this to the exercises, which then meant that the exercises were not only more specific, but far more effective. So besides rehabilitation, you got bracing. Now bracing has two types. You've got hard brace, which ranges from all of this. And you've got things such as the Boston brace, Milwaukee brace, uh, you've got Chanel brace, you've got so many different types of braces. And one of the interesting things was this, it, according to the Journal of Pediatric uh, Orthopedics in 2007, it was actually quite interesting when they, when they did the research and they found that rigid braces was actually only 15% effective which is actually quite surprising. And they also found that 79% of patients who wore the rigid brace ended up having surgery. So it did not stop the surgery. If anything, it actually, they progressed towards it. And one of the reasons being was that the rigid braces was using the three point pressure method, which pushed the spine and made it look straighter, but it did not activate the nerves or the muscles or the bone. So what spine core did was they also created a rigid brace. So spine core actually does have a rigid brace itself. And this is actually, once again, it's known as CMP brace, corrective movement principle brace. So you are braced based on the movement rather than pushing and shoving your spine into achieving artificial straightness. You are braced based on the classification and your brace according to the movement. And this was actually found to be quite effective. So there are many different designs, daytime, nighttime, light brace. And just to give you an idea, these are the results that you can see. So from 35 degrees down to minus four, meaning you completely reverse into the opposite direction. You got 34 degrees down to five degrees, 
30 degrees down to minus two, many gone into the opposite side. And so this is actually rigid bracing using the spine core method. And uh, we're trying to introduce this to Philippines so and Indonesia, so they'll be getting this soon. Okay, and um, so bracing once again has hard brace, but then comes the soft brace. So when we talk about the soft brace, we're dealing with spine core in this case here. And, and one of the reasons why we talk about spine core is that spine core was, was found to be 89% effective. So once again, when they looked at the hard brace, it was 15% effective, 79% ended up having surgery. Whereas when you're dealing with soft braces, it was found to be 3.9 times more effective than the hard brace. And for those patients who need to have surgery, what was most interesting was that it was 3.7 times more effective in stopping that curve from progressing towards surgery. Now, it doesn't stop the surgery, but if you compare a spine core brace to other braces, it was almost four times more effective in stopping it from progressing. So worldwide studies uh, conducted on over, over 400 patients over 10 years, it was found to be 89% effective compared to rigid brace, which is only 15. Now, we're almost getting towards the end. Uh, some of you probably have seen this. And one of the things is this is called technospine. This is actually part of spine core as well. Now, there are certain types of scoliosis where if you're an adult and your spine is extremely unstable and the bone has completely shifted, no amount of bracing is going to stabilize it. And for some individuals, they cannot do surgery, either because of their age, osteoporosis, or, or, or other health issues. So techno spine was actually designed to be quite specific. So you can actually see it has a pumping action. So when you're at home, you can tighten it up, you can, al you can alter the amount of pressure to, to help stabilize the spine. And this is something that we can, you can go to the spine core doctors and they'll be able to prescribe this to you. And so the only thing though, is that it is a bit bulky, because once again, this is actually designed to, to secure the whole brace around the pelvis to stabilize as an anchor, and it pushes the spine. So this is actually more for people who have really severe type of scoliosis uh, that needs that support, okay? This is not suitable for children. For, so for children who have severe scoliosis, uh, look into spine core first, and if the curve it's quite aggressive and it's more of a structural type of scoliosis where the bone, you've got bone erosion or you've got compression, then you may be looking at more of a CMP brace. But spine core brace in itself is, is more than effective in handling most of the different types of scoliosis. Now, the other thing is, this is not scoliosis related. Okay, this is also from spine core. So, once again, so since we're talking about spine core, we've also had people asking us, what does spine core have? Like, is it only just bracing? So spine core actually does have this. This is called uh, sacral fix. Now, a lot of people actually suffer from back pain and they will go to a pharmacy or a spot shop and buy one of those back support straps and wrap it around the waist. But what is actually interesting is that did you know that sacral fix is actually the only device that has ever been researched that has been shown to be effective? Okay, so this is actually quite interesting because people are walking into a pharmacy, they're walking into a spot shop and they're buying all these back supports and they've never been tested. Whereas this sacral fix has, and it's actually been shown to be not only very effective, all the research have actually shown that it provides the most amount of stability and it is safe enough for pregnant women. And this is something what we call pelvic girdle pain. So a lot, of people, a lot of women who are pregnant, and if you've been pregnant yourself, you'll know that you suffer from quite a lot of back problems and you don't wanna keep taking medication because you're worried and some others are absolutely um, terrified of taking medication because they're worried how it may impact the baby. Um, some, some mothers are scared of doing acupuncture, they're scared of the needle, you know, and then so, what do you do? And sacral fix was actually found to be quite effective for, for a lot of these um, women with um, spinal problems. Okay, um, hopefully I kept within my, my time restraint. I know Amanda is very strict. 
you know, initially she told me that Darfam, you have one and a half hours to chit chat. And then she sent me a message last night and said, you got 30 minutes. And I think I went over 30 minutes to exactly one hour. So I kept it below one and a half hours. Um, yeah, so do, does anyone have any questions at all? Yeah. So once again, today's talk is mostly specific about um, spine core itself. Okay, so uh, if you're interested in knowing more about the different types of scoliosis, uh, more than happy to, to address that as well. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Fong. Um, we actually have uh, a lot of questions in um, Scoliosis Philippines uh, Facebook Live uh, page. Um, indulge me. Uh, I have, um, let me read their questions. Uh, sure. How and where to purchase uh, spine core and how much, please? Okay, with, with spine core, um, depending on which country you're in, the good thing is that for us, um, we're quite fortunate that as a distributor for Malaysia, Philippines, Indonesia, we're able to buy it in bulk. And as such, we, we brought the prices down quite tremendously. If, if you compare the pricing of spine core in Philippines, in Philippines, it's 110 peso, uh, 110,000 peso. Now, if you compare, uh, that is approximately about 3,000 Singapore dollars. If you get this done in Singapore, it's almost 4,500. If you have this done in UK, it's almost uh, 2,500 to 3,000 pounds. In, in America, in some parts of the States, they charge up to 7,000. So worldwide, Philippines is actually one of the cheapest in the world. And we are able to do that because we buy everything in bulk and we, 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 you know, we, we push the benefits to, to the public. If you're in Indonesia, it is uh, 30 million juta, I mean, th uh, 30 juta. I know for those people in the Philippines are thinking, oh my gosh, it's in the millions. <laughs> okay, so 1 million uh, in, in Indonesia is equivalent to about $100, yeah. So in Indonesia, it's uh, 30 juta. In Malaysia, it's about uh, 7,000 to 8,000 ringgits. So in different countries, but once again, um, as you, a lot of the doctors will actually tell you that they have clients flying in from overseas. In Philippines, a lot of the a lot of the doctors are seeing patients from the Middle East, and these are not Filipinos working in the Middle East. They are actually Saudi Arabians and etc. Come to Philippines, come to Indonesia, Malaysia for bracing, and the reason being is a lot of them have noticed that if they brace in their own hometown. It is actually far cheaper to fly over to Philippines or to Indonesia, Malaysia, stay in a hotel, get braced, and fly back. So we're able to do that. Now, on the other hand, you probably a lot of people will say that, wow, 110,000 is actually quite a lot of money. And unfortunately, it is. And, and it's because um, spine coin itself, when we, when we buy it, it is not cheap um, because of the intellectual property, et cetera. So we are buying it from UK. But if you compare the difference with spine core compared to, let's say, a rigid brace, for patients who wear the rigid brace, whether you're in Malaysia, Philippines, Indonesia, normally your bracing program takes two to uh, at least two years. And during that two year period, you will need to change that brace at least three to five times in that two years. And each time you change that brace, if you calculate it, if you take the price of your heart brace and you times it by three times or five times, it actually comes out almost double or triple the price of spine core. Now, the other thing with spine core is that if a person's spine changes, you are able to modify that brace and reconfigure the brace immediately. Whereas if you have a rigid brace, you can't do that. With rigid braces, you have to wait at least three to six months before you are able to change the brace, to make a new plaster model. It takes at least a week to get it. Whereas with spine core, you're able to change that brace, reconfigure it, change the tension, the pressure right on the spot. And if the curve changes, you don't have to make another new brace. All you have to do is reconfigure the brace. And most of the spine core braces can actually last, um, if you take good care of it, anywhere from two to five years. Um, I think Amanda still has a brace and it's been since 2016 and 
It's already five years, and I think your brace is still going strong. Yeah. So we, we've got people wearing braces, the spinal cord brace, for even up to 10 years. And the most I've ever done is to change the elastic bands. So the spinal cord brace itself will last um, unless, of course, you gain weight or you lose weight. And um, that's the only time that brace will cost you more. But otherwise, the spinal cord brace in itself is actually quite cost effective compared to any other bracing. Yeah. Um, in terms of where can you get it, if, you, if you're in the uh, Philippines, you can contact Amanda or Scolio Care Corporation, and they will refer you to the closest practitioner. Um, there is actually a bracer, a spine core provider, um, in most parts of the Philippines. So everywhere from Rojas to Mindanao to Cebu to uh, even in Luzon, North Luzon, everywhere. Okay, so um, there, there's always, a, and even Baguio, okay, there's always someone close to you. Okay. If you're in Indonesia, uh, contact us, PT Indo Sehat Utama, or you can message me directly, and um, uh, you'll be able to, to you know, get hold of who's the closest one. In Malaysia, same thing. You can, you can contact me, and I, I can refer you to someone closer to you. Okay? Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Fong. And no um, here's another question. What are the requirements to avail spine core? And yeah, um, what are the requirements to avail spine core? And um, yeah, you can answer that first. And I'm going to look up more questions here in the chat. Um, maybe you can read them um, in the chat. Uh, okay. But these are from the Facebook Live, yeah? No problem. Thank you. Okay. What are the um, requirements? Yeah, thank in, you. In terms of the requirements, um, number one being is that the, the individual has to, number one, be able to, to walk. For example, we do get some severe scoliosis where the, the patient is unable to, to move, they're, they're wheelchair bound, okay, or they have severe types of um, stringomyelia or spina bifida or some sort of neurological condition where they're unable to, to walk, um, or if they have things like Parkinson, Alzheimer's, or they do require assistance. Um, for individuals like that, unfortunately, spine core is not suitable for you. Now, in terms of who can wear the brace, um, I think one of the things is that we actually, we, we train the doctors um, in such a way that they actually, we, we always encourage them to reject more than they accept. And because spine core brace is such that you have to be very, very discerning in terms of who you're going to brace and what is the effectiveness of it. So there will be a lot of patients who come in and they will have curves which are quite severe. And they will say to you that, look, I do not want to have surgery. Okay, so I want this brace. And they will look at the brace and see it as probably like a miracle. I mean, we, we do understand because when you look at the before after images of spine core, it is actually very impressive. And so a lot of patients will come in and say, look, you know, I have a very severe curve. I don't want surgery. You know, um, can I use this brace? And the answer is in some cases, yes. And in quite a number of cases, we'll say no. Um, and this is actually part of the spine core training. So when we train the doctors, we, we train them to, to be able to discern who is suitable and unsuitable for bracing. So if you do have scoliosis, the most important thing is go and see your spine core practitioner because they will actually say yes or no to you. Now, in, this, in, the, in the period of their training, so a lot of the spine core practitioners, even to this very day, um, we monitor them, okay? So just because they're already practicing doesn't mean that we let them run free. Okay, so uh, we, we believe in quality control, and, and, and it, that is something that we, we're, we're quite serious about. So with every bracing, it is all documented. And as such, we're able to overview and, and, and have an oversight of how they're bracing the patient. And the other thing is, before they brace the patient, they must gain approval from us first. So as a trainer, if I have a, 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 a doctor who wants to brace a patient, they have to discuss that case with us first as a trainer. And only when they've actually gone through the case with us are we able to say, yes, 
or no, you can brace this patient or you can't. And this is once again part of the training so that over time they learn what type of cases uh, they can brace and what, are the, what type of cases they should not touch. So once again, if you go to a spine cord bracer, there will be a lot of times you walk away disappointed that you were so-called rejected. And, and it's not a bad thing, it's because for some patients, really, literally surgery is the only option. And for other patients, we get a lot from, let's say, orthopedic surgeons referring over. And the spine cord brace is probably the most effective method non-surgically. Okay, yeah. Oh, we have someone from uh, Central Java, Indonesia. Ah, apa kabar? Ya, dua puluh tahun, empat lima derajat. Okay, so I'm practicing my Bahasa Indonesian. It's not that good. Um, so for Yayang, in terms of will the scoliosis continue to get worse over time or will it stop at 45? Now, as an adult, you're no longer growing. But just because you're not growing doesn't mean the spine is just going to stop at 45 degrees. And it really depends on what type of curve you have. So for some individual, the, the curve may stop and for others, it may continue to be progressive. So at 45 degrees, it, that is still quite, it's considered a severe curve. So I would recommend, uh, get a check. If you're in central Java, you can go to Solo. In Solo, there's a practitioner there called Dr. Melissa Saputra. Um, so in Solo, look for Dr. Melissa. She's able to, to have a look at your spine and let you know where, um, uh, whether or not you're suitable for bracing. Now we also have Jen asking, is chiropractic able, uh, can chiropractic help scoliosis? Now that's a very good question. Now chiropractic is effective in treating people with scoliosis, but it doesn't mean that they treat the scoliosis itself. So you may have a lot of patients who come in. So for example, a chiropractor may have lots of scoliosis patients. And when you do ask them, do you treat scoliosis? I mean, do you have lots of scoliosis patients? And the answer is yes, they do. But are you treating them for the scoliosis or are you treating them for the problems that the scoliosis is posing? So if they said that chiropractic itself cannot change the scoliosis, it may improve the posture, it may improve the, the, the alignment, but scoliosis is not just a structural thing. It is a bone that is growing. For example, in children, in children, if the spine is growing and the curve is getting larger and larger and you're adjusting away, unfortunately, that is considered being rather irresponsible, which is one of the reasons why in America, a lot of chiropractors also learn spine core. So they are able to combine spine core and chiropractic. So they can use the chiropractic to stimulate the spine, to, to improve the overall proprioception of the spine, reduce the pain maintain stability, get the get, get, um, flexibility there. And then they will follow up by using the spine core brace to stabilize the spine that they've just adjusted. So if you're using chiropractic alone, that might not be sufficient enough, that you may need to complement that with the bracing. Okay. Um, in structural scoliosis, individuals who are nearing or reaching skeletal maturity, would correction of curves cause destabilization of the spine? Okay, that's a very good question. Uh, this is from Louise. Uh, that's a very, very nice question. Okay, so in structural scoliosis, it really depends on, on what you're trying to achieve. For example, if you are an adult or you're achieving, you're approaching skeletal maturity, it really depends on what type of curve we're dealing with. For example, are you looking at a double curve, single curve? Are you looking at triple curves? For example, and in terms of the compensatory, when you do spine call, you do learn about primary and secondary curves and how to brace it specifically. So for example, if I have a person who has a double curve and the primary curve is in the upper body, in the thoracic area, and the lower part, the lumbar area, is the compensation, you are not going to be trying to so-called reduce that compensation as such, but you'll be stabilizing it or you're correcting the movement of how it behaves. And that in itself does not destabilize it. If anything, it actually strengthens it. It stabilizes it because you're stimulating that spine to, to, to strengthen and you're maintaining the core stability of that spine. So in cases of structure, for example, in adults, in quite a, num quite a large number of um, adult patients who have um, uh, destabilization of the spine, 
for example, when they hit menopause or they, they've reached a certain stage of the spine and where they've never had scoliosis all their life. And then suddenly when they hit menopause, the scoliosis just pops out of nowhere. And then it, con it causes severe degeneration and instability. The spine cord brace in itself was shown to be um, effective in this patient. So it doesn't destabilize it. If anything, it can help improve stabilization and support there. Okay. Um, there's another question about how much is the cost? We mentioned it and how often to replace it. In terms of replacement, it's most, most people probably in Philippines so far, um, looking at the, the records of all the patients, I would say so far less than five people or less than 10 people have ever replaced their, spine, their brace. They probably may have replaced the bands, but the brace itself, not that often, unless they've completely trashed it okay, or destroyed it. Now, one thing about the spine cord brace is that it is quite resilient. Okay? It is durable. You can use it. You can play spots. You can do everything with it. And, but the only thing is when it comes to washing it, you've got to be very careful. You cannot use bleach. You cannot use fabric softener or anything with conditioner or moisturizer because it uses Velcro as its attachment um, adhesive system. So if you use something like a fabric softener, that whole brace will become very mushy and, and the Velcro unfortunately will not stick. Okay, so in terms of replacement, um, for the bands, once again, it depends on usage. For most people, they probably don't replace it for more than a year or so. Um, in terms of payment by installment, um, unfortunately, in Indonesia, yes. Uh, Indonesia, you can actually do it by installment. Um, for example, over here, we call it Cicilan. In Malaysia, it depends on the practitioner and in Philippines. Most, most doctors don't have uh, installment uh, facilities. But depending on the practitioner, so if, if their center actually does have credit card facilities that can do installments, then that is something you can discuss with them. But um, from what we understand in, in Philippines at, the, at this point in time, I don't think there's any. Yeah. But in Malaysia and in Indonesia, yes, they do. Yeah. Uh, Claudine, you mentioned that you were diagnosed with radiculopathy, your scoliosis is 45 degrees, dextro, and bevo 28. You're 54 years old, should you use it? Um, hi, Claudine. In, in, in this case here, I would say have it assessed and have it looked at. Um, if Amanda doesn't mind sharing it, uh, Amanda is quite a young lady. Her curve at the time, if I can remember, was 50 degrees on top and 38 at the bottom. And it managed to reduce it down to 25 degrees and 23 degrees. And um, within the first few days or so, she had pain relief. She came off a medication. Uh, at one stage, uh, Amanda was taking quite a lot of uh, painkillers, and um, um, I think she stopped using that. Um, uh, I actually do remember every conversation I have with everybody, including their angles. Um, so uh, in, in your case, being 54 degrees, you're still quite young. Our youngest is four years old. Our oldest is 90 years old. And so in terms of should you use spine cord, I would say have your spine assessed first to see what type of curve you have and whether it's suitable. For example, if there's things like compression fracture or there's severe osteoporosis um, or there's other conditions like stenosis where, where, the, where the spinal cord goes through the spine, if there's narrowing of the curve, then maybe not. But once again, before we say no, um, have your spine check first to see whether or not you're suitable. Okay. Uh, Lily, you say, will decreasing weight lessen your pain? You're 55 years old and have mild dextroscoliosis. When you were younger, you used to weigh 125 pounds. I don't feel pain, but now with your 150. Um, weight loss generally, can, uh, yes, it can reduce pain. But that being said, quite a lot of, quite a lot of patients with scoliosis are not overweight. Um, there's quite a lot of them who are quite lean or in some cases tall and lanky, and they have pain. So have, losing weight in itself is good for your, for your health. Uh, whether or not it can reduce the pain, uh, it, will, it, will, it does contribute to taking less pressure off your knees, off your joints, uh, off your back. It, it may help with the back pain, but you need to find out what is the source of your pain. Is it due to your spine? Is your spine causing the back pain? Or is your pain causing your spine to be um, misaligned, for instance? For example, there is something called antalgic pain, 
where if you have something like a bulging disc or, or, or degenerative di uh, joint disease, your body will tend to lean more to the opposite side to avoid the pain. So over time, that becomes a habit as well. And, and so rather than just thinking about losing weight to, to address your pain, um, I would recommend go and find out what's causing your pain in the first place. Okay, Renier. What is the difference between bracing and spine cord? How about tension giving to the patient? Okay, um, Spine Core is, is actually a, the company is called Spine Corporation. Okay, so the company is called Spine Corporation and the brace that they use is called Spine Core. But they also have other braces like CMP brace. So Spine Core itself is, is a system. It, it, is, it, is a, it is a system of assessing, analyzing, classification, the bracing technique. So it, it is a whole system in itself of how to approach someone with scoliosis. So it is very comprehensive. So when an individual comes in, ranging from the initial consultation to the report of findings, to the clinical assessment, the actual analysis, uh, to establishing what is the classification, to ascertain what type of proactive movement is to be used, how to brace, what components are to be used, what sizes, what tension, how much pressure, what is the configuration, um, what is the, the, the components to be used, what is, um, all of that is actually spine core in itself. Um, when, we, when we train the doctors, there's over a hundred different things that we look for. And any of the spine core doctors who have undergone accreditation will tell you that we will literally stand there with a checklist and we go through every single one of those checklists to make sure that the practitioners do not miss a step. Okay, and that is actually how you get accredited. So you have practitioners who've been doing this for almost six years and they're not fully accredited. Okay, and, and in Philippines, we're quite, uh, quite fortunate that we've already got four people accredited far faster than other Asian countries. Okay, so Philippines, you guys are doing fantastic, yeah? Um, and Spanko only just started recently in, in, in Philippines and, and the doctors in Philippines are really achieving accreditation, full accreditation. Okay, so samangat everybody, yeah. Um, and about the tension given to the patient, okay, every spine core practitioner, when it comes to the patient, you're not treated as, you know, a piece of meat and a bone. Okay, because every single scoliosis is different. Okay, and that's why the 39 different curves, even the 39 different curves itself, every classification is unique. So let's say, let's give, let's say your classification number six, for instance. A person with classification number six, and person number two with classification number six, and person number three with classification number six. Okay, the way we brace may be the same, but the technique used is different. The pressure that we use, the direction that we use, the methodology, the amount of um, tension or the pressure used is also very different. Okay. Okay. Um, Maya Elaine, is spine core affordable? Uh, I can't answer that actually. <laughs> so it, it really depends on, on, on your finances. But in terms of pricing, once again, it is far cheaper than other braces. Okay. Long term ones. Um, is spine core available in Mindanao? Absolutely. In Mindanao, there is um, Dr. Yoyo Hoy. Um, in Davao, you also have Dr. Ed. Uh, Charmaine, what is the lifespan of spine core brace? Ah, we mentioned that before. Um, it depends on your usage. For some people, it will last you five to 10 years. Okay, but of course, by then, it's already discolored. The elastic band has probably, it's, it's like wearing an underwear that's going to last you 10 years, okay? So for some people, it probably wouldn't last very long, okay? Because literally, you are wearing the, the pair of pants, and it's almost like an underwear, okay? So uh, it depends on how long you use it and, and, and how, how well you look after it, okay? Uh, Sabrina, do you recommend spine cord to a 43-year-old patient for pain management? Um, once again, for most people, studies actually show that um, adults with pain, they usually find that within the first uh, six to eight hours of bracing, they do, they do notice uh, pain relief, okay? And, but once again, before we, we create a blanket statement like that, 
you have to find out what is causing your pain. Uh, for some people, it may be compression fracture, others may be bone spurs, other people could be nerve impingement, um, it could be absolutely anything. Okay. Uh, Ray, uh, we have uh, Mr. Ray Lim, thanks for a very informative forum. Uh, is it recommended for 12 year old with 24 degree? Absolutely. Um, there was a study done in 1984 by Carl Steen, uh, sorry, Carl, Carson and, and Lon Steen, where they found that if a child was 10 years old and the curve was more than 20 degrees, it is a 100% progression. So they were doing studies where they were trying to see if a child has scoliosis, how do you know if this is going to be progressive or do they grow out of it? And what they actually found was that in, in a lot of children, most kids when they're, when, when they're from below 10 years old, they will have some form of scoliosis okay, or some sort of spinal misalignment. And most children, by the time they hit puberty or they go into the second phase of their growth, the spine improves. But unfortunately, there are also some individuals who will go from having scoliosis at the infant stage and as they reach teenage years that scoliosis can become quite aggressive and it becomes progressive and it continues and it gets worse and worse and worse now for other individuals if they have if they have not had their menstrual cycle yet and they have scoliosis usually for the first one and a half to two years they might not see any changes in the spine and then suddenly when they hit one and a half to two years after the first menses the spine goes through a, a rapid growth rate. And that is actually where it gets very scary because once that growth rate starts to kick in, the spine can grow so aggressively and rapidly that that curve can, can, can deteriorate at a very rapid rate. So once again, in, in terms of scoliosis, it really depends on, on, on the individual, the child, um, how severe is the curve, and what is the curve when, when, it, when they first presented with it. Okay. Okay. Right. Wow. Um, yeah, Dr. Pong, uh, we have a direct message um, sent to me. Good evening, Dr. Pong from Karen. Uh, how effective is spine cord for neur neuromuscular case like cerebral palsy who are ambulatory? Ah, okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, as much as spine cord is effective in most um, individuals, when we train the practitioners, there are also what we call contraindication. So there are quite a number of cases where we do not encourage bracing. And so one of them is cerebral palsy. Because in order for a spine cord to be effective, there has to be communication between your neuromuscular system, so your nerves to your muscle to your bone. And that is actually how you are able to stimulate nerves muscles working so if someone has cerebral palsy that neurological pathway um, may be compromised in that sense so the way they move the way they they walk it alters their biomechanics and unfortunately that they might not be suitable for bracing under the circumstances uh, but if it's very very mild uh, cerebral palsy once again the practitioner has to do the assessment and they have to see whether or not uh, the child has any kind of spasticity where the muscles are either uh, hypertonic or is there any signs of weakness in the spine uh, or in the muscles. So for most cases of cerebral palsy, the answer is unfortunately no. But there are exceptions where if it's extremely mild, then um, it is something that we'll discuss. So for, for cases like that, what we normally do is that we'll discuss it with the practitioner and then we will take all the information that we have and we'll send it to Spine Call UK. And there's a panel of practitioners, uh, of, of trainers, and we will discuss the cases. For example, there are cases where uh, an individual spine is quite severe and they do not want to have surgery or the orthopedic surgeon does not want to operate. And there are cases where under those circumstances, we may be considering, look, if you're not going to do anything, the spine is going to get worse. And if we do intervene, then the, the patient has to absolutely understand that the brace is not going to change the spine, but it is going to provide some sort of um, support there. And only under those circumstances do, do, um, do we allow the bracing to be approved. But under most circumstances, the answer is no. 
Um, so once again, uh, do, do, do communicate with us, see a practitioner and, and let them do the assessment to see um, whether it's mild cerebral palsy or is it extremely severe. Okay, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Fong. Um, I see a hand uh, from uh, Mei Ling. See, please unmute and ask uh, Dr. Fong. Oh, hi, Mei Ling. Yes. Uh, Mei Ling is from Malaysia. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Hi, Mei Ling. You have a question? Your hand is up. I think we have to move to another question oh, here okay. in um, Facebook Live, Dr. Fong. Um, yes. Miss uh, Mami Gia Armonio Garzola asks, um, sana po makapag-avail kami ng spine cord braces para po sa anak ko, 40 degrees curved uh, thoracic, then 36 degrees lum lumbar scoliosis. Um, she said um, she hopes to avail a uh, spine cord brace for her um, child who has 40 degrees um, thoracic and 36 degrees on the lumbar um, side. Okay, so um, another question, Rona Dorado Villanueva, and, um, can we avail in an installment, installment basis? And another question is, um, one moment, um, um pain management what's the lifespan okay this has been uh, asked already okay so uh, Sheila uh, mommy Sheila sana po maka-avail kami ng spine cord para sa anak ko uh, she also says say, uh, says the sa same um she hopes to avail spine cord for her child um yeah so basically those are the questions and um concerns posted in the facebook live there are more questions um, here on the chat. Rainier Rion Donga, is there a chance that prosthesis, oh, that they have chance to teach how to use uh, this or the spine core? Absolutely. Uh, when it comes to, to spine core bracing, um, every individual, so the practitioner usually will do all the measurements or the um, uh, it's basically like going to a tailor. Okay, so we always train, we always train the doctors to think that when they see you, you are basically a tailor that is using a product and fitting it on the individual. And so it is not surprising that when you see a spine core practitioner, they'll have a measuring table on the neck instead of a stethoscope. <laughs> okay, and and they will have a bobbing pin on their hand, etc. So. Um, so what we do is that the practitioner will then take the product, they will do the measurements, they will do the fitting, and then they will show you how to wear it and how to put it on. And we make a point that if you cannot put on the brace by yourself, you cannot go home, okay? Because we have to make sure that you are able to wear it correctly before you leave, okay? And, and the reason being is that when you wear the brace, you'll be wearing it for at least 20 hours a day. And, and the standards actually show you do not wear it for 23 because you see, if you're wearing a rigid brace, it is 23 hours. But if you're wearing a dynamic brace, it's 20 hours. I guess so it's very, very different. And the difference is that a rigid brace is 23 hours with zero movement, whereas spine cord brace is 20 hours with absolute mobility and resistance. So your body is constantly fighting the elastic bands. So it's pretty much like you having resistance exercises 20 hours a day. Okay, so you, a lot of people wear the brace for the first few weeks. They will tell you, it feels like they just came back from a gym, that the whole muscles feels very tight. They feel as if they lost weight. A, a lot of people will tell you they lose weight wearing the brace. And it's because the whole muscles actually start to tone up and it strengthens. Um, and uh, in terms of, do you know how, how to wear it? Absolutely. Because we will actually show you how to put on the brace, how to fit it, um, how to maintain it, how to maintain the, the, the pressure and the tension. So um, absolutely. So uh, your practitioner, it's also part of the training as well, that they have to observe how you wear it, how to remove it, how to put it back on again. Okay. So uh, once you have the brace, it, it's not as scary or daunting as it is, as it sounds. 
Um, I, I know a lot of people are probably thinking that, oh my gosh, if I get the brace, you know, I, I need to wake up two hours before I go to school. And the answer is no, it doesn't. Uh, most people can actually put on the brace in less than 30 seconds. It, it's literally that, that fast. Once you know how to use the brace, most people can do it with their eyes closed. Yep. Yeah. Yay. Um, so we are posting a feedback poll, um, please, um, for our um, Zoom or participants, please uh, indulge us so we'll know what to improve on our scoliosis uh, learning forum. So uh, I hope everyone will be um, sending us the feedback poll. Okay, so one last question uh, we have here uh, from Renier Riodonga. Um, actually, Dr. Fong, uh, Rainier is a prosthetics uh, orthosis tech of POC. And he's, oh, wonderful. Uh, yeah, he's asking if is there a chance to allow to practice, to teach to wear a spine core as he is a prosthesis and orthosis tech. I think he's interested to, yep. to brace um, for, for his patients. Yeah, thank okay. you. Thank you, Sir yeah. Rainier. Okay. Um, when it comes to bracing, uh, in every country that we go to, as long as you are in a profession that allows you to handle the patient, allows you to, uh, to make braces, absolutely. For example, in UK, if you are only an orthotist and a prosthetist are allowed to make braces. Okay, even a physiotherapist or a rehab specialist are not allowed to make braces. So only an orthotist. So in other countries, for example, like in America, uh, you have chiropractors, osteopaths, um, and orthotists, prosthetists, who are, and even Australia, who are licensed and allowed to make, to make braces. So as long as the country allows you to, to handle the patient, absolutely. For example, uh, we have in other countries where you have a medical technician who's allowed to handle the patient to do things like blood tests and to do laboratory type of work, but they're not allowed to, to treat a patient. Uh, so in that country, they're not allowed, but in other countries, they're allowed to do so. So um, Renia, in, in terms of, I've, I've been to POC many times. Um, so I don't know whether I've seen you before. Uh, I'm usually, whenever I'm in Philippines, I'm in, I'm in POC quite a lot of times. Um, yep. So um, have, have a chat with the hospital as well, because it depends on the hospital. Uh, so, for example, we can treat the, the uh, we can teach the practitioners, but it also depends on where you work as well. Um, some hospitals will only prefer, let's say, a, a practitioner to do it. For example, um, only a rehab specialist. And in other hospitals, they will only want an orthopedic surgeon to be the one that does the bracing. So, so once again, um, it really depends on, on the licensing and the procedures. But otherwise, um, yeah, we're, we're always more than happy to train anybody, um, uh, even in Indonesia, Philippines. And, and, and the good thing now, especially, we've been doing a lot of training by Zoom. So if you're interested, you can always send me a message. Um, we, do, we do the training by Zoom first. So what we do is that we teach you all the principles how to do the classification, um, how to approach uh, patients with scoliosis. And then we are also creating video. So uh, we've been chatting with Spinecore UK to create uh, videos to teach the practitioner how to put on the brace. Now, the other thing as well is when you are putting on the brace, I will be there either by Zoom or WhatsApp watching you. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so if, you, if you know, Doctors like uh, Dr. Crescencio, Dr. Hector, Dr. Cho, all of them will tell you, uh, even Dr. Byron, that when they're bracing patients, I I'm usually there. Uh, so even though I might not be there physically, okay, I'll be there in the background, you know, um, you know, like, no, 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 that, that brace, you need to put that band a little bit higher or, or tighten the pants up a little bit more, okay, move that spine a little bit more this way. So I think with that, because of the training, you will know exactly what I'm talking about. So when I say that band number two, move it across here, you are able to do that, okay? And, and we are actually creating another system where the brace is fitted before we send it out as well. So that is something that we are trying uh, for countries such as Myanmar. So uh, we are considering having training in Thailand and Myanmar 
um, and other Asian countries. So that is something that we're looking at, that we are providing the training by Zoom. Okay, so if any of you are interested, um, you can always message me uh, as long as you're a practitioner, um, your country allows you to, uh, or even for some people, uh, for example, we have hospital administration. They, they message me and say, look, can you, am I allowed to join your spine core training? Absolutely. So, but you will not be allowed to brace. Okay, so you can actually join to learn about the principles of spine core, about what does it do, how does it do the bracing, what, it, what is the mechanism behind it. Okay, um, most people will brave it and do one hour, one day of eight, hours, or some people may prefer two days, four hours each. Okay, so once again, if, if you're interested in learning spine core, and it doesn't matter where in the world you are, uh, more than happy, just message me, and then we'll create a Zoom link, um, and then we'll give you access to spine core. Now, in order to do bracing, one of the things you have to do is what we call SASWAM. Uh, for every patient that gets braced, spine core expects you to document everything. So we are able to audit and monitor and see how you're bracing every individual. So we can actually see, um, so basically we're maintaining quality control. Okay, so you'll be given access to web. Um, and so we will give you a registration form. You fill it out, take a picture, WhatsApp, send it to me, and then we'll, we'll send the um, access code, everything for you to, to undergo training. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Surya. No problem. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much for all your very uh, interesting questions for Dr. Fong. <laughs> wow. Uh, I know you're overloaded, Dr. Fong. So it's no, uh, no, no, no. <laughs> the weekend and the busiest day for you. Sorry to uh, no, no, no. bother you again. Um, I, I, we learned so much uh, tonight. And I'm sure um, everyone is excited to um, have them uh, or their daughter or sons assessed um, for, for uh, spine core uh, because they are all, um, um, you know, hopeful that this will be the non-surgical treatment for their uh, children and of course for themselves uh, if they're the patient. And we also have uh, practitioners um, who are interested to um, you know, uh, learn more about spine core. So where do they, um, how do, or how do they uh, contact you? If you can uh, like uh, share to us your contact. And of course, uh, for, for patients, um, where, where do they go? Um, so in closing, so um, we have to wrap up and we will be awarding the certificate of appreciation. Uh, to Dr. Fong tonight. And before that, uh, let me just um, remind everyone in the party, uh, for the Zoom participants, uh, we have the feedback poll um, still on, on screen. I hope you can answer uh, before we um, turn it, uh, rather take it down. Okay, thank you so much. Um, you. Dr. Yeah, Dr. Fong is sharing his um, um, link to his Instagram on Facebook and of course um, he has also a YouTube um, and uh, he has lots of references that you can check out on, on his page and um, of course uh, we, we also you can also visit School You Care Spine Core on uh, Facebook um, and visit um, scolucarecorporation.com. Uh, it's the web um, website. And of course, you can, uh, for those who, who know or who, who has scoliosis, okay, you are uh, welcome to join Scoliosis Philippine Support Group. Um, let's connect. Let's um, help each other. Let's together, let's raise awareness. Let's empower and um, um, let's have a sustainable, sustainable uh, community that, that care for each other. Uh, you know, so we um, consider Scoliosis Philippines as your Scoliosis family. So we are here to reach out and, you know, through our learning forums, this is the only way that we can do in this pandemic, okay, because we cannot do meetups uh, um, physically. So 
we make the most of the time of our online presence. So let's all thank uh, Dr. Fong, um, Rizzi, can you please um, share to us uh, our certificate of appreciation for Dr. Fong? Once again, thank you very much, yes. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, um, right. Um, maybe you can um, enlarge it, please. Okay, so um, the Certificate of Appreciation is proudly presented from Scoliosis Philippine Support Group Incorporated to Anthony Fong for his outstanding presentation and our learning forum on the topic Spine Core Conservative Scoliosis Management held on October 16, 2021, 7 p.m. via Zoom and Facebook Live, signed by yours truly, Amanda Bonifek Yamko, founder and president of Scoliosis Philippine Support Group, and the membership director, Rizzi Mia uh, Biaka Palma. Dr. Fong, it's always a pleasure and always a privilege to hear from your very uh, wonderful uh, sharing and insightful and impactful uh, learning again for tonight. So um, we have nothing but gratitude and we're always um, happy to, to learn from you. Okay, um, we are very happy that these are the key take takeaways that um, spine core is not just focused on the dynamic bracing, I only learned it tonight that we have a lot of spine core hard brace and um, semi hard brace and uh, combination of dynamic bracing. So there's a lot um, of like um, a lot of um, new um, technology that, that we learned tonight. Uh, and aside from, you know, we just don't only have to rely on the hard brace because um, some hard brace are no longer um, like, or rather it's not um, as effective as um, well-researched uh, as a spine core system. Okay, so um thank you so much any last words um before we end this session thank you dr fong okay, and, thank you um, very much yep. yes thank you um let's let's all hear from dr fong for his uh closing once again thank you to everybody for for joining us uh, i know it's a saturday night uh, quite a lot of you are very busy um one of the most important things is that when it comes to scoliosis, a, a lot of people, when you have scoliosis, um, you probably feel it's actually quite daunting. And um, uh, I know that a lot of moms or dads, um, either you feel quite upset or distressed or, or you know, in denial. Um, you know, scoliosis, you know, like I always see all of you say, you're bent but not broken, you know, and it's very true. You know, we, we, we come across so many people with scoliosis and, you know, you guys are the strongest people that I've encountered, okay? And so stay strong. Um, I have yet to see a, an individual with scoliosis come up to me completely distressed. Um, if anything, you guys are very strong fighters, you know, and stay strong, there's help out there. And uh, part of the things that we do is that one of the reasons why um, I was very keen to bring Spine Core over to, to Philippines. Okay, it was, the story behind it is actually quite interesting. Um, because initially everybody said, why are you bringing Spine Core to Philippines? You know, it's such an interesting country, it's a small country. And, as, and, and I have a lot of gratitude for people in the Philippines. Okay, um, uh, everyone from the teachers that I encounter to, to, you know, to, to the people who look after my family, um, so it is my way of saying thank you to Philippines, you know, and um, that's why we fought very hard to bring Spine Core in. Um, Amanda was there at the beginning. You, you've seen all the tribulations and all, all the stress that we went through to try and bring it in. You know, I'm very grateful to Amanda, Amy, and the rest of the team in Scolio Care as well, um, you know, for being there. In Indonesia, same thing, you know, we, we have a lot of gratitude people in Indonesia and Malaysia. and and the countries that I that I um, become a distributor in actually has a has a very has a very close emotional um, I, I have very close emotional attachment to it, and that's why I'm, I'm very strict. Okay, so when most of you who have seen me teach spine core, 
um, you'll notice that I'm I'm not very forgiving in that sense. Okay, I, I don't grill the I don't grill the doctors. I'm very nice to the doctors. I'm very uh, I'm very patient with the doctors, but we hold everybody to very high regard, um, and, and that's because it, it is a responsibility that every practitioner has to the patient, and you cannot abuse that trust. Once you abuse that trust, you know it doesn't matter how good your product is, and that's one of the reasons why we reject a lot of bracing. So if you do come across any spine core practitioners and they do not allow you to brace, don't blame them. You can blame me, okay? Because I'm probably the one who told them not to brace, okay? Um, because there's probably other better options out there for you. But once again, thank you very much for, for being with us um, and, and for being with us in this whole journey and stay strong. Um, I don't know when I'm going to see you all soon. Stay, stay healthy and wear a mask. And make sure you wash your hands and get vaccinated. <laughs> okay, I'm not, I'm not anti-vax. Okay, so, so I've already been double jabbed. So, so all of you stay healthy and make sure you wash your hands and wear a mask. Okay. Right, Thank right. You. Thank you, Dr. Fong. I Thank hope you. everyone can open their camera for a uh photo uh op with dr fong okay um let's turn on our cameras everyone arizi will do a screenshot okay smile everyone ready please open your camera All right one two three smile Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so thank much. Thank you, Dr. Fong. Thank you. Thank you for the uh, time. Thank you. Thank you, Warriors. Thank you so everybody. much. God bless. Happy thank weekend. You. Stay safe. Bye. I hope you all learn. Ciao. Dr. Fong. Bye, <laughs> Mandai. You guys you. take care. All of you, you take, take care. care. Okay. Thank you. thank you so much. Okay. We'll keep in touch. All right. Thank you, Dr. Fong. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Um, this has been another um, Scoliosis Philippines Learning Forum. And this has been uh, in partnership with Scoliocare Spine Core. Um, uh, let's all um, be grateful, uh, be thankful, and be safe. All right. Thank you, everyone. Mabuhay and um, God bless. Bye. 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 Bye.